Today it marks a turning point in what we're going to be dealing with. Previously, we were dealing mostly with the underlying basics, what we need to understand algorithms. Today, we're changing that and we're just going straight into the algorithms. So that should be good fun. I also have a very slight cold, so if I sound a little raspy, uh, that is probably why. Or well, someone could be using the microwave again. There could be many reasons. Uh, but yeah, got seven participants. No one's in the waiting room. Uh, we'll get started. No one has any objection. We will get started. And uh, because we will be doing actual algorithms today, not just like paradigms and heuristics and definitions. Good morning. Uh, we will today be doing some actual algorithms. So uh, that involves use of the Notepad program. So that should be great fun. Uh, yeah. So today we're going to be discussing a very broad class of algorithms, searching and sorting algorithms, which form the functions of searching and sorting collections of data. So let's deal with what that is. So searching is, according to Google, when you try to find something by looking or otherwise seeking carefully and thoroughly. So in the case of computer science, searching is when you have a collection of things and you want to find a specific thing in that collection of things. For example, uh, in a less computer science perspective, many of you will probably have experienced searching for a remote. And if you are old enough to drive, which some of you probably are, you may have experienced searching for your car keys. And if you are older than I think anyone in this meeting is, you may experience searching for these, which they're very difficult to find and they're very easy to lose, unfortunately. So it happens to all of us. We lose track of things. So uh, searching is all about finding things that you don't immediately know where they are and you want to find them. It's pretty straightforward that. So without any further ado, uh, actually, I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask the group. Uh, can you think of a method of searching? Say that I gave you a, uh, a list of things, which I'm going to type out like a person. Uh, welcome to the meeting. Uh, so the question I'm just putting out right now is, if I gave you a collection of things, say uh, a bunch of numbers, say one, two, three, five, seven, nine, 11, 12, uh, and I asked you to find the nine in it, uh, how would you do that? Like, it may sound like a very stupid question, but how, which algorithm would you perform if you were a computer and you were just given like a list of numbers, maybe put them in a more random order, not necessarily a sorted list of numbers, just like say two, one, five, nine, eleven, 11, uh, seven, 12, scanning. What would scanning entail? That's a very good answer, but well, what does scanning mean in this case? Um, looking at every single number. Indeed. Would you do them in any particular order? Just from top to bottom. That's absolutely right. And as it happens, that perspective is the very next slide, linear search. You go through your collection, one element by one element. And for each of the elements that you find, you just check, is this what I'm looking for? And if it's not, well, you'd go to the next one. You, you struck out and you'll see if you can hit a home run, home run on the next one. Uh, so for example, if you're at a school and you've got a bunch of students, and they're all lined up, and they're all wearing name tags, and you want to find a kid called Joe, you would walk through one by one. Is this Joe? No, it's like Thomas. Is this Joe? No, it's Sarah. Is this Joe? Blah, blah, blah. Go on. Eventually you find Joe, you're happy, you're done. And it's pretty straightforward. It's the technique that you would probably use if you had a bunch of stuff and you wanted to find a specific element in it. Uh, and notice, by the way, this keyword random students in the line. The students aren't lined up alphabetically or height order or something like that. They're lined up randomly. And that is important. And we're going to see why on the next slide. But first, I'm going to ask you a question. Which paradigm, which algorithmic paradigm, is this algorithm. Uh, bonus points for those who can remember, who can actually remember the algorithmic paradigms we discussed in the previous session. Uh, I will give you a hint, it is not dynamic programming. Uh, there were four others, it is one of them. So who can guess which one linear search is? Or who can even name all the uh, paradigms we discussed? I spoiled one of them, dynamic programming, but who can name the other four? All three of them. Or two of them, or 
or even just one of them. Greedy algorithm. If you forgot, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. There's a lot of them. Difficult to keep track. Me too. Absolutely, me too. Yeah. Uh, memory. It's tricky. Uh, greedy is one of them. Uh, in fact, I think we should probably just like take a quick look at algorithms two. I don't have algorithms two. That's a bit weird. Uh, go back to slides. Ooh. Here's algorithms two. Lovely. Uh, so back in algorithms two, we dealt with the different paradigms. Brute force. I'll move this so that you guys can see it. Brute force. Backtracking, greedy algorithms, divide and conquer, and dynamic programming. Dynamic programming and divide and conquer were the ones where you can break your problem down into smaller bits. In divide and conquer, they overlap. In dynamic programming, they don't. Someone has just said the correct answer in the chat. You are very correct, Sophie. It is just brute force. From the last thing, the, the definition of brute force was directly computing by enumerating every single possibility. It's a bad way to solve a Sudoku. We went over that. And not that. And yes, this is just brute force. We are going through one by one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And yeah, that's really all it was. It's was, it was brute force. And you might be able to guess from the image choice here that brute force is not that great. But also, somewhat paradoxically, it is the best. For a random algorithm, for a random collection, you're not going to do any better than linear search it would be impossible to come up with a better algorithm. And the reason why is because coming up with a better algorithm than this would involve like skipping over some things, being intelligent and going, ah, I don't actually have to look at these elements to know that they're wrong. For example, uh, if like you knew that you were looking for a brunette and for some reason all the redheads decided to line up on the other side of the classroom, you know you don't have to look over in that corner. If you knew Joe was dark haired, you would look in the parts that wasn't redhead. But the problem here is this word random. For random elements, linear search is the best we can do. That's just all there is to it. So it's 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 a turtle, but it's the best turtle we're going to get. But there is a better way. And it involves, if linear search is not the best we can do, if the objects are sorted into some order. For example, in our previous uh, student's example, what if the students were in a line? Can anyone think of how we could use, say, say that I gave you a classroom and I told you, hey, there's a bunch of students in here uh, and one of them is named Joe and you have to find them. And uh, I've lined them all up in alphabetical order. How could you find Joe without just going, ah, uh, well, go start from A and go along? How could you find him in a more intelligent manner? Any ideas work? Oh, and I should probably cover the answer because it was just being displayed on the screen. I will take a bite of pasta while you figure it out. That is a good idea. However, you may notice that uh, if you look at a school role, Students are less likely to have, say, oh, this is a terrible example. Uh, I was going to say students are less likely to have names starting with like W or X, but the person who just suggested this has a name starting with X and W. So that was the worst example I could possibly pick. And my sister's name starts with a Z. But uh, statistically speaking, statistically speaking, uh, the latter half of the alphabet is less likely to have a child's name in it than the former half. I don't know why, but it just statistically speaking is true. So J might not actually be in the middle. And in fact, what if I withheld from you that I was actually playing an awful trick on you and every single person in the class, aside from Joe, was named Aaron. So then Joe's at the very end. Then we've got a problem. However, this here, by the way, bonus points if anyone can remember. Uh, I say bonus points, bonus points don't really count for anything. But if you can remember what this statement here, which I'm highlighting, J is like in the middle, so go to the middle of the line and look. What this statement here is, because it is not an algorithm, but what it is, is a word that came up in the last session and had a whole section of it devoted to it. Who can remember? We only discussed two words in the last section, paradigms and the other thing. What was the other thing? The 
because this is a great example of it. Good morning uh, to the people just joining us, by the way, there's, I think, two or three of you. Uh, we are discussing how a, at a boy and at a girl, we, we're doing so well here, man, we're doing so well. Uh, the answer is heuristics. We are discussing heuristics. Uh, specifically, we are discussing uh, what would happen if I gave you a bunch of students in a line, alphabetically sorted, and I told you to find Joe. Uh, and someone has suggested J's in the middle of the alphabet. It is. It's like 13 or something later. So just go to the middle of the line and look. And that is an excellent heuristic because even though statistically speaking, students are least likely to have names in the latter half of the alphabet, probably J is still going to be around the middle. Like if you took a, if you took a real life class and lined them up like that, J is probably going to be around the middle. So I, the probability that, like I gave in my example, every student aside from Joe is named Aaron, with his name starting with A, is just like really small. So in this case, the heuristic didn't work, but the heuristic would probably work in most cases. And that is the definition of a heuristic for those who remember from our last class. But we can do better than the heuristic. And the way we can do it is by making an observation. Let's say that we chose a random student and they said that their name was Hector. Now. Hector has an H, and H comes before J. So we don't actually need to check any of the students to the left of Hector. We're just like, oh, you guys, no matter what your name is, it starts with a letter that is before J. You ain't Joe. So if we just look at a student, we can immediately discard all of the people on one or the other side of that student. And that is super powerful. So I present to you binary search, a method of locating objects uh, for those who don't know, what we are doing is studying the location of objects, searching in uh, collections of data. Uh, binary search is not just a good, but actually the best method of locating objects in, in a uh, random but sorted search space. So not in a randomly assorted, I don't know why I used the word random, but in a search space which doesn't have a pattern, like uh, it could be just as likely to be all Aaron's as a normal class distribution, but what it is, is sorted, i.e. all the students are lined up alphabetically, then binary search works. So enough yammering about it. Here's how it actually works. Once I can figure out how to exit full screen, I'm going to bring up, where is it? Paint. We're going to bring up paint and we're going to discuss binary search. So here's how it works. A little bunch of students, which I will represent with little lines because I'm not an artist, I'm a computer programmer. And those don't tend to overlap too much from my experience. So what we have here is a bunch of students here, and they all have different names. Say they start with like A, C, here's Hector, here's Joe, and then maybe uh, in a W, another W, because why not? W is a cool letter, and a Z. So these are our students. These are the letters that they start with. We're trying to find this fellow. And being humans, we can just look at it and go, ah, there's, there's the J. But uh, the way you would do it with binary search is you would pick a random letter, say this W here, and you would go, OK, W is after J. So we know that everyone coming after the W is definitely going to be after J. They're after after J. They're way out. So we can just eliminate all these people. We can also eliminate the W for that matter. So we know that our desired objective lies somewhere in here. So what we do now is we pick another one. Say so most of the time we pick around the middle of binary search. That's why it's called binary. You're every time you're bisecting. The bi in binary, bisect, bisexual, all these different things means two. Uh, so in this case, we're every time we're slicing it up into roughly two parts. Uh, so here we take, say, the H, are you J? No, you're not. And are you after or before J? You're before J. So everyone that's before you is going to be before before J. So they are also going to be out. And we don't even have to look at I don't know, Aaron and Catherine to know that they are not Joe. We just know that they're pre present before Hector. And so we're all good. And so finally, we've cut down in only two moves and only two observations. We have cut down our entire search space of uh, eight people down to two. And we have a 50-50 chance of just getting Joe on the next one, or we might get in, realize that in is wrong, and then immediately get Joe next. But notice how it only took us like three things 
Whereas, whereas to find Joe previously, uh, we would have to run through. It would also take, actually, in this case, it would take three operations. But like if Joe was over here, for example, or if we were trying to find the Z, it would also take us only three operations. You can try it and see. Uh, whereas with the normal linear search, it would take one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven operations before we finally got to Z on the eighth. And this is useful. And also, this three, though, is what I want to direct your attention to, because it's not just a random number. Who knows the relationship between three and eight? And two, the bi and binary, the two, which is very critical. Who knows the relationship between two, three, and eight? Absolutely, 100%. Top marks, two cubed. In this case, that is not a coincidence, not by a long shot. Uh, two cubed, for those who don't know, means just two times two. Uh, I am very bad and slow with this. Uh, two times two times two, so that's three times, and that will be eight. Uh, so, in this case, the fact that two cubed is eight, and it took us three operations to find our desired element, is not at all a coincidence. And if you think about it real hard, you might realize why that is. Because every time, every time we look, we're roughly cutting everything in half. First we cut it in half here, then we cut it in half here, and then we just about cut it in half here. Well, actually, when we did it, we cut it in half here, then we cut it in half here, and then we cut it in half here. But basically, we had eight things, and we divided them up, each time halving, and so of course, we're going to have to halve three times, because eight is two cubed. If, if you're not following that, or if you just don't like math, that is fine. There will not be that much math. But yeah, that's the idea. And I want you to keep this in the back of your mind, that if we have like uh, n, say, if we have n uh, different things in our list, then it took roughly what's called mathematically, what is called log n operations to get the required element. So just keep that in the back of your mind because it will come up later. We're not going to save that absolute garbage. And now, what paradigm is this? Fingers crossed someone gets this, or I will just look very stupid. Uh, shoot, shoot it out there. Don't be afraid to just take a quick guess at it. Definition one. Uh, oh, you mean like you want to hear the definitions? Uh, I will not give you the definitions because that will make it too easy. I'm not sure which one you're referring to. Uh, here we have the paradigms, brute force, backtracking, greedy, divide and conquer, dynamic program. Anyone else, by the way? I noticed that the chat is like, Actually, a lot more people than before. We've got a lot of different people. Backtracking. Backtracking is dynamic. Backtracking is a good idea, but it is not quite backtracking, unfortunately. Dynamic is a, is a closer idea. Uh, it does relate a little, but uh, it, I'm looking for a different... Yeah! Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. All right. Divide and conquer, that's the one. Okay. So what we are doing here... Oh, sorry for like, yeah. Uh, so yes, we are dividing and we are conquering. Oof. So, oh, in fact, I wrote it on the screen. That was silly of me because that kind of gave us gave it all away. But yes, it is absolutely divide and conquer. We are taking our big problem of we got a lot of different elements, we got a lot of different students, and we're cutting it down into smaller and smaller pieces with this epic knife of binary search. And by the way. Just to confuse you, binary search has absolutely nothing to do with binary, like zeros and ones. I just put this image here because that's what everyone thinks of when they think of binary, or at least most people. This is, I believe, from the matrix. So that's pretty cool. So much for that. Because now we're going to discuss why I'm not writing code for this binary search. Uh, I didn't write code for linear search either, but that's because like it's so intuitive that to write code for it would be a travesty. But binary search, I'm not writing it because, well, 
here are some fun facts about the history of binary search. The first published implementation of binary search, so the time that someone came up with it, was in 1946. The first time someone actually managed to write a correct code of binary search was in 1962, a solid 20 years later. Of the top 20 computer science textbooks, 15 of them wrote, and we're talking about textbooks here, 15 of them taught you how to do binary search wrong. They, well, they taught you the ideas, right? But they taught you how to actually code it up wrong. So yeah, binary search is a very difficult, I, I feel like I should impress this upon you, binary search is very confusing. It seems like kind of immediate. No, 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 get out of here. It seems kind of immediate, like we're just cutting things down so that we can get more accuracy, but it is surprisingly confusing sometimes. And yeah, there are reasons that I'm not discussing uh, binary search here with code. I'm just discussing it out loud. That will not be the same for future uh, computations, for future algorithms. But anyway, also, a little fun fact here, Bell and IBM are the world's, or were in the 60s and 70s, the world's two top of all time, like, uh, computer science institutions, the biggest, uh, the biggest ones, basically. IBM made all the computers, they made the computer that got people on the moon, they did it all. And Bell, I believe they were involved in radio signaling and detection, and also in telephones, so for a little history there. So they took all the world's top programmers, they gave them two hours to write up a proper binary search, and 100% of them, because you know they're the world's top programmers, 100% of them were like, oh yeah, easy, no problem, two hours to write this tiny program. And 100% of them thought that they got it right, and only 10% of them actually did. So yeah, this is the short note on why I'm not writing code for that. So much for that. This is a two-part thing for uh, those who weren't here at the start. We're discussing searching, but we're also discussing sorting. Searching being when you look for stuff, like uh, remotes, or car keys, or children, and sorting when you take some Un, some messed up array of data or some messed up collection and you try to put it in a good order. And there are a lot of reasons you would do this. Uh, you could have a bunch of data uh, if you're Google and you want to rank a search thing, for example. Uh, for example, if Google wants to get me all my uh, all of my different uh, search terms on the screen, they will have to sort them into an order before displaying them. Uh, that's one application. Another application is if you want to apply a binary search, you're going to, uh, as it says, you have to order the objects first. If you want to apply binary search, you will first have to sort the data. So that is, and since binary search is like so much faster than normal linear search, uh, it's just definitely worth it to know how to sort data. So uh, according to Google, sorting is the arrangement of data in a prescribed sequence and for example, you might have a Rubik's cube and you're trying, they have great little puzzles, I think, in fact. I even have one over here. I have no idea how to do it, but it's super cool. Like you just spin it around and basically what you're trying to do is get all the colors on the same sides. Uh, like in this image, starts like this, ends up like this. And what you are doing there is you're applying sorting procedures. So before I start anything else, this is a little scatterbrain, but before I start any actual description of sorting algorithms. I would like to see, what do you guys think would be a good sorting algorithm? If, for example, I gave you a punnet of strawberries and told you they were all of different weights and you had to line them up, uh, you had a scale to compare them and you had to line them up uh, in weight order and you didn't want to be there all day, which algorithm could you apply? Anyone got any ideas? As in method, yes. Which method could you apply to try to uh, create from the punnet of strawberries in no particular order, a ordered lineup of strawberries? How could you pull that off? Any ideas from anyone will go a long way. Even a partial idea, just a fragment of an algorithm will go a long way. Brute force, excellent. And how, 
And in fact, that is the very next algorithm. Not quite brute force, actually. It's not quite brute force. It's a little more sophisticated than that. Weigh each one, check it if it's heavier than the last. Excellent. Heavier than the last. So like if you had them in an original messed up order, you would what? Go through them and weigh each pair? Or is this what you were suggesting? Excellent. Because you've just reinvented something called bubble sort, which is the very next slide. So bubble sort is a great algorithm, uh, very good for teaching. Uh, it's not used so often these days, but it's super, super cool. Basically what it does is, uh, nope, not that. Basically what it does is it takes a bunch of things, say strawberries, and lines them up in some random order. And then in this order, it goes through and it takes each pair that are next to each other. And if they're out of order, then it swaps them around. And otherwise it just leaves them as they are because, hey, they're already in order. So basically what it's doing is it's trying its best to get an ordered list by making little bits of order at the small scale. And it will eventually succeed. You might have to give it some time, but it will eventually succeed. Where is my MS Paint or Notepad? Notepad will do better for this. So uh, this might sound a little confusing, but basically, uh, let's try this. Let's just try an example. Uh, two, five, four, three, eight, one, seven, and I'll put a six in here. So the way bubble sort works is, uh, first up, is this list sorted? No, it's not. We want it sorted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and it is most certainly not sorted like that right now. So we're going to just start off by going through the pairs one by one. First up, two and five. These are in order. Two is less than five. We're all happy. Things are the way they should be. Five and four. Not the way they should be. Five is bigger than four. We swap them around. Four, five. Place five, four with four, five. And we just keep going. Five, three. Also, bad, we'll make that 3-5. Five. 5-6. Five, the 5 started out over here, and it kind of swapped around to here, and then it swapped around to here. But now it's going to stay here because 5 is less than 6, and this is properly ordered. And now 6-8 is the same, it's properly ordered. But 8-1, well, that is clearly not properly ordered. It becomes 1-8. And then finally, 8-7 becomes 7-8. We've done our first pass, and now we check, is it sorted? No, still not. So we do it again. Two, four, good. Four, three, bad, swap them. Four, five, five, six, these are all good so far, no problems. Six, one, that is a problem. Six is bigger than one, we put them in the other order. Six, seven, that's fine, and seven, eight, that's fine. Notice how already this is two, three, four, five, one, six, seven, eight. It's all sorted except for like this little one sitting on its own out there. And so, who can guess what the next thing we're going to do is? Can't you just have a template? Yes, you most definitely can. You most definitely can. But if you had the template, well, then you've already sorted the data. If you have like two, three, four, one, five, and your goal is to turn it into one, two, three, four, five, well, you already know what the goal is. Just swap it out. You're happy as Larry. But often you won't just have a sequence of numbers in ordinary increasing order. You'll have like not just all the numbers, but just a selection of numbers or something more confusing than numbers. And when you get to that, you're going to have to improvise, unfortunately. Do it again till one is in the right place. Yep, that's exactly how we do it. Two, three, fine. Three, four, fine. Four, five, fine. Five, one, not fine. Make that one, five. And the rest of it is all. Fine. Do it over again because it certainly isn't sorted. That one is still out of place. This is fine. This is fine. This is not fine, and we'll make it one four. Still fine. In fact, all the rest of it is again fine. It's still not sorted. Nope. Still not sorted. Do it again. This bit at the start is still fine. Has been the whole time. This is not fine, but we'll just change that. We'll be happy. Three four. That's fine. Four five. That's fine. Six is bigger than five. Seven bigger than six, and we are all good. Final try, two, one, swap them around. Two, three, good. Three, four, good. Four, five, good. Five, six, good. Six, seven, good. And seven, eight, great. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and we're great, and we are done here. And now I'm going to give you 
a small one. Who can type out the first swap we're going to do in the chat? What it's going to look like after that, after we make our first move? Spot on. Absolutely. That is correct. Now about how about the second move? So we've already done the three, five, one, four, two. And now, yes, excellent. Three, one, five, four, two. And I'm just going to make the chat into my sorting algorithm. What's next? I shouldn't highlight it. Three, five, one, two, four. Uh, so we are up to four, five right now. So it will become uh, four, five, and then it will become two, five. So we'll end up three, one, four, five, two, then three, one, four, two, five. And from here, oh, it almost looks like pi. That's pretty cool. Uh, so from here, you can probably guess how we're going to go. What's the next move? Just make sure everyone's got it. The next move, what will it look like after? I think people have got it. Yeah. Yeah. One, three, four, two, five. And from there on, it'll be just a short distance till we got our one, two, three, four, five. And we will be done. So yeah, that's bubble sort. It's not too difficult to understand, but it works. And this can be a difficult problem. In fact, this is a difficult problem. And yeah, bubble sort is just a way to do things. And it's a way that works. And now, as before, what paradigm are we talking about here? Which one is this? I highly recommend, by the way, for those who are not yet familiar with the paradigms, I will uh, I will just type the names of them out. Divide and conquer. We saw this one with binary search. Brute force. We saw this one with linear search. We have greedy algorithms. We have, uh, am I stupid? I may be stupid. Uh, dynamic programming. <laughs> that is correct. That is absolutely correct. Dynamic programming. Oh, bonus points if you can name the last one, by the way. Person who just got the right answer. Can you get the right answer again? Or will someone beat you to the punch? We've got divide and conquer, brute force, greedy, dynamic programming. But there are five, not four. Can anyone remember the last one? This is my half-hearted attempt at cheating because, yes, okay. Good, great. Thank you so much. Backtracking is correct. I completely forgot it, and I was just hoping someone would have it, and you had it. Thank you so much. So the answer was, as Sophie said, greedy algorithm. This is a greedy algorithm because at each point, it's just like trying to make the little amount of order it can. It can't sort the whole list at once. It's not smart enough to do that. But what it can do is take two little things and just check, are they good or are they not? And if they're not, it can change that. And by making these little optimal decisions at each step, overall, it does end up finally making an overall win. By the way, uh, this is one example where greedy algorithms do work. There are examples we discussed with the crab cakes, I believe, where they don't work, but this is one where they do. So that's pretty cool. And now, I'm going to take a short break from algorithms to discuss the last theoretical insight the, for this session. And, well, by this session, I mean of the next four lessons. After this, it's just going to be pure algorithm, but there is one last thing we need, and that is a way to compare algorithms. Because I said, you may remember, I said binary search is better than linear search. But what do I mean by that? How can one algorithm be better than another? They both solve the problem, don't they? Can anyone think of one a way where an algorithm could be better or worse? Because they are not all created equal. Some are good. Some are not so good. Faster. Excellent. Faster. So it takes less time when you run it on your computer. Resolve solves. They both work. Uh, and that is definitely true. Can anyone think of another way we can me measure performance? And faster is good, but I will pose a question to that. If I ran accuracy, yes. Accuracy in this case isn't too much of a concern, but because binary search and linear search, eventually, if the data is sorted, binary search will get there and linear search will also get there eventually. If the data isn't sorted, binary search will be screwed. But uh, if the data is sorted, uh, linear search and binary search, they will both eventually be accurate. So yeah, but yeah, you could definitely make the comparison that linear search is actually better because it works on everything. 
Whereas binary search, you've got to have it sorted first. And that, as we can see, bubble sort, that takes time. But a little question. We've heard the word faster being used, but faster on what? If I ran uh, the linear search algorithm on a million, a data size of about a million, I think, it would take about one second on my personal computer. You put that on Google's like massive server farm thing, it will not take a second. It will take like blink of an eye, a millisecond, and will be immediate. So faster, yes, but I mean, linear search will beat uh, anything to the punch if that other thing is being run on my poor old computer and the linear search is being run on a Google supercomputer. So is there a different method we could use for performance? Steps. That is the exact word I'm looking for. Actions, yeah. Both of those, that is absolutely right. Uh, another thing that could be is memory. Uh, like one uses more or less memory than the other, but that's beside the point. Actions is absolutely right. And in computer science, those are called operations. Medical, nothing to do with it. An operation is every single time that a computer does something. There are a lot of things that a computer can do. But an operation is every time that a computer carries out a step in an algorithm. And actually, I'm just going to uh, ask you now, what, what kind of things could a computer do? What things do your computers do? At a very basic level. So like a computer does show you YouTube, but that's not really an operation so much as millions and millions of operations at once. What are the basic building block operations? Hey, counting. By the way, I notice it's mostly Ariel, Caroline, and Sophie. If And that is a great three, but there are, as it happens, 10 people in the room. So if you if you see something, say something, speak up, you know, it's, it's good. It's good to be engaged and all. That's not good. That is not good. I'll check if someone's microwaving. Give me a second and think of operations, because counting is one thing. Counting is definitely one thing that a computer can do, but there are different things. Just a moment. Okay, it will hopefully do a little better now. Uh, there was music being played. Sometimes that messes with the Wi-Fi. Uh, it's not as bad as microwaving nachos, but it's it still messes with it. So freezing sometimes, that's a common symptom. So has anyone thought, hey, scanning, ordering, any sort of mathematical operation, that's honestly basically all of them. Moving things around, like those swaps we were doing, looking at a thing, a scan, ex making an examination, like checking is three less than five or three bigger than five things like that, mathematical operations, that's, that's basically all of them. Perfect answer. So operations are when computers do something and they are invariant. If you run the same code on a Google supercomputer, sure, it'll do it in less seconds, but computers don't think in seconds. They think in operations. And it will definitely be in the same amount of operations as if you ran it on my computer. If it's the same algorithm, it will do it in the same number of operations. One will just do it faster. So the way that we evaluate how good a computer is at its job is by counting up the operations that it uses. How good an algorithm is at, it, at its job, sorry, not a computer. It's misspoke, but yeah, that's how we evaluate how an algorithm does. And, well, actually, I'm going to ask you before we go into average case, motivating, motivating question, how many operations does linear search use? Because it really depends. How many operations will linear search use? If you're feeling confused, then the answer, scanning, sorting, evaluating, indeed, those are the types of operations they will use. But the question itself is actually malformed. How many operations linear search uses will depend on the size of the data set we give it. Uh, for example, if I give it a data set with a billion things in it, it'll probably take longer than one with just a million or a thousand. Uh, it will definitely take more operations. However, what if I gave the thing, the data set one, two, three, four, five, and asked it to look for a five, and then I gave it the data set five, 
and then like that was followed by like a billion twos. Uh, say that there's a billion. That's not a billion, but say there were. Which five will it find faster if it's using linear search? Awkward pause. Spot on. We'll find the second one. And who cares that there are a billion twos after it? It's linear search. It goes through one by one. And if the first thing it finds is a five, more fool you, I guess. We, we got it. So it depends on the data set. But it also depends on the assortment of things in the data set. So asking the question of even saying, say, I gave you a data set with a million operation, uh, with a million items, how many operations will it take? Well, if we're looking for the first item, one. If we're looking for the last item, a million. So even that isn't a well-formed question. But a well-formed question that we could ask is, how many operations is it going to take on average? If I gave you a bunch of different randomly generated data sets and asked you, uh, and say they were all of size, let's use a variable here, they were all of size n, uh, how many operations is it going to take for linear search to find the answer on average? In over two. In over two is correct. Kind of. Uh, in over two is typically how we think about it, but technically it would uh, it would first it looks at a thing and then uh, for each element, first it looks at it and then it checks it against the thing. So first it has to get the element in its hand and then it has to check it against the element we're looking for and check if they're equal or not. So really it would take two operations for each of half of the things, which would be a total of n operations. But that is beside the point because n over two is the right idea. It is, it is the idea that the out, if you do a random set, the item we're looking for is most likely to be in the middle. That's the average position of the item we're looking for, in the middle. It's not so likely to be on the sides. It's uh, Overall, it'll average out to be probably in the middle with linear search. So uh, this brings us to an idea of an average case, because if it is in the middle, as it is on average, then it will take us about n over two operations to find it there. So some inputs, yeah, an algorithm will solve easily, as we've talked about. Some inputs it'll struggle on. And the average amount it has to do on a data set is n over two. By the way, for bubble sort, uh, not for bubble sort, for binary search, who can guess the average amount of operations for a binary search? Because there's always the possibility that this element that we're looking for with binary search is in the middle. And so it's the first one we pick and we're like, ah, we got it, easy. And that's one operation. And then there's the possibility that it takes ages and it takes, uh, well, if you remember back, it takes log in operations. Will it take somewhere in the middle? Will it take log in over two? What will it take? This one's a difficult question, but the answer is basically that it ends up taking around login operations in the average case. But this is not the central point. The central point is we have our average case thing. How can we formalize this notion a little bit? And this is the central thrust of the argument. We can formalize this idea of an average case into a uniform notation that computer scientists use in order to make comparisons between different algorithms. And that notation is called big O. And here is a terrible meme that I found on like a blog, which is teaching students how to do big O. And so for your viewing pleasure, Obama is telling you that it's big O showtime. Now, if we say that our data set that we're looking through has size n, where n is just the variable for the number of things in the data set. Then we can talk about how many of those oper how many operations we're going to have to do as a function of that n. For example, we've said that n over two is one possible function of that uh, n uh, in the linear search case, and log n is another possible function. 
in the binary search case. Uh, and the way you write this down is just with a big O before it. Big O in over two. Or big O log in. It's how you write it out. And it's a pretty cool notation because writing a big O around something has an effect on it. Next up. This is the trickiest part and the part that most people struggle with. So if you are not understanding something, feel free to ask questions, unmute, ask in the chat, whatever. So the tricky part of big O is that the constants in a big O don't actually really matter. O of half n, we consider to be the same as O of n, which we consider to be the same as O of 1000 n. Ignore this part for now. I'm just going to focus on this. The constants in a big O don't actually matter. All we care about is how the function behaves. I'm going to bring up a little graph thing to show you why. So let's do y equals x and y equals x over 2, y equals 1000x. Oh, that one, maybe a bit too high. Uh, 10x, sure, that'll do. So these are three different functions. They behave differently. Three different graphs. But what do they have in common? We're actually a little low on time, so I won't, uh, I won't wait around. Uh, what they have in common is that they are straight line graphs. So you could have different graphs, of course. You could have like squares, which are curved like this, or even cubes, which are curved like this. Uh, they go up and then they go down. There's a lot of lines on my screen now. But the point is that those, uh, is that those graphs like 10x or just normal x or half x, all of those, uh, I suppose I should be calling them n, uh, and it actually works. Oh, Dismos is good to me. No, it's not. Um, but yeah, basically the idea is that they all behave similarly, the, and that the constants don't actually matter because consider a a function that works in two n operations would uh, would be indistinguishable. Uh, I'm just going to clear these off. A function that works in two n operations would be indistinguishable from a function that works on in operations if I put the in operation one on a computer that was twice as slow and the two in operation one on a computer that was twice as fast. It would be indistinguishable. They would just behave the same, no matter which data set I put in. But if I put an n and an n squared together, they would never look the same, ever. Maybe they'd coincide at like one point, but after that, the n squared is just going to go off to infinity. And so that's the central idea here. Not that, that. The central idea is that first up, the constants don't matter because the machine you're doing your algorithm on can differ and that can change how the algorithm behaves. All that matters is like the shape of the growth of the algorithm's operation use, if that makes any sense at all. If it doesn't, please tell me. Uh, and furthermore, furthermore than that, we can talk about small terms, but first, is everyone kind of on board with that? Kind of on board with the idea that uh, in operations like O of 5n or whatever, that's basically the same as saying O of n, which is basically the same as saying O of 12n. Is everyone kind of on board with that or anyone having a little trouble with it? Because the central idea is that machines vary, but uh, the shape of uh, the shape of the curve stays the same. You can think of this, this graph here, y equals uh, half n, as the growth of the number of operations uh, needed by the uh, linear search algorithm on average as we increase the size. So the size would be along the x-axis and the number of operations would be along the y-axis. That is exactly right, the same graph type. So you could have quadratics, cubics, exponentials. There's a lot of different things. A lot of math is pretty cool. There's a lot of different stuff in math. Uh, and furthermore, on top of that, we can also say that the smaller terms don't matter. So the person in the chat, Sophie, said that the graph types are different. And that's true. But it's not just that they're different. Some are stronger and some are weaker. In particular, uh, if the zoom thing goes away, Consider these two functions, n and n and one and a hundred n squared. So the way we see it now, uh, this 
in squared function looks kind of small. It's, it's lower than in. But which one of these functions is stronger? Which one's going to dominate over the long term and grow faster? Can anyone guess? Between this parabola, this curvy one, and this straight line one. The n squared one. Red at first appears to be right, but when we zoom out, the parabola just zooms off faster, every second growing further and further away. And indeed, now let's consider what would happen if we had them both at once. Say uh, y equals n plus 1 and 100 n squared. The idea here is that, so I'll get rid of this, the idea here is that this function is kind of made up of two components, the n and the hundredth of n squared, and over time, hundredth of n squared is going to dominate. And we can even see this right now. Uh, when we zoom in real close, it looks a little like the line, it looks a little like the line, but as we zoom out, the n squared dominates, and the overall shape is that of a parabola, not that of a line. Parabola being, by the way, uh, the name, the fancy mathematical name for anything that is the graph of a square, or a, uh, an equation with a square in it. So it's almost like the n squared is stronger than the n. It's almost like it's winning at an arm wrestle or something. One comes up against the other, and one of them just wins. And now let's consider, say, a different function. Instead of just powers of n, let's consider log n. Uh, log n, y equals log n. And this is zoomed out. Uh, consider log n. Which one is stronger? This one's kind of a tricky question, but which one is stronger? Log n or, uh, in purple or y equals n in black? Because before we had one that was uh, 1 100 in, uh, in squared, and this is now in red, and it looked like it was being beaten, but then it came back because it was curving upwards. Is the same holding true for the log? Black, that is correct. The black one, in this case, the red, the purple doesn't get to make a comeback. It just kind of dies off, whereas the black one runs away to infinity. So the black one is stronger. And furthermore, if we were to add them both together, y equals log n plus n. I'm not sure if it understood my bracketing, just like that. y equals log n plus n. At first, this looks a little like the curve of the log n, but as time goes on, it just is a straight line, nothing else to it. The log n is absolutely dominated by the n, and the n is just stronger. And that's the idea. The smaller terms just don't matter. Big O of n squared plus n is the same as big O of n squared, because generally in computer science, we use arbitrarily large data sets. We won't be using, like, when I opened up Notepad and did, like, eight numbers or five numbers, it'll be more on the order of a million, a billion numbers. And at that level, what tends to happen is the... Is the smaller terms just kind of die off. And furthermore, if I were to add a thousand or whatever in here, this would still be O in squared. Even though this looks so strong because it's got that massive constant, it would still be just O in squared because the constants don't matter. So, uh, and this is the ultimate hierarchy, the ultimate breakdown of who beats who. So, in factorial, this one, uh, I'm just going to use x actually, just for the sake of. Uh, drawing the graph. Zoom in a little. Ignore what the heck is happening on the other side of this graph. X factorial beats x to the n, uh, beats 2 to the x, beats x squared, beats x, beats log x. Root x is somewhere in there. Root x beats log x as well. In fact, all, all like powers of x beat logs, and then all of them defeat the constant function, which is y equals 1. All of them eventually beat this. So this is a lot of different graphs on the screen, but basically what I'm trying to say here is that in the end, some of them are stronger and some of them are weaker. And if you were to add them together, for example, x squared plus log x plus square root x, this would be, in big O notation, this would be the same as just x squared because that's the biggest one and the one that dominates. So, so much for equivalence. Take a quick look at the exercise, because we're almost out of time here. We, and I don't want to go over again, that would be unfortunate. So, 
Let's classify these. Who can tell me which ones of these are equivalent to O of N? Just O of normal N, everyday N. Remembering that constants don't matter and uh, some things are dominated by other things. Can anyone spot any of these that might be equivalent to ON? Yeah, two people got it already. Great. So what's happening here is first up, the one doesn't matter. The one dies off. The one is just a tiny constant and it doesn't affect in the long term. And second of all, this 2N is the same as N. The constant doesn't matter because we could just run it on a different machine that's twice as fast. It will behave just like an ON. So at the end of it, 2N plus 1 just becomes an N. But there's another. There is another. N plus log N is correct and 14 is not quite correct and I will explain why in a moment. So N plus log N is, uh, is correct because the N is the stronger of the two. The N beats the log N and the log N just dies off. The reason why 14 is not correct is an interesting one because if you draw the graphs, you would find that Y equals N and Y equals 14 are both straight lines. They're both straight lines. But the trick here is that they don't behave quite the same. The 14 is flat forever, whereas the n goes off to as big as you want it and more. So while they may look the same at first, they are not the same. The difference between different functions is not just whether one is curvy or not, like the x squared here, it's curving and the lines are straight, but also how they behave in the long run. Are they staying the same forever or are they going up? So now, the 14 is in the case of its own, it is in the case of O1, the constants. O1 equals O2 equals O14, all numbers are equal. In the view of big O, it's all equal. So that's how the big O of 14 works, it's the same as big O of 1. Now who can spot the quadratic ones? And there are two of them. Who can spot the ones that are O in squared? 3n squared, that's one of them. Who can spot the next one? It's somewhere in here. Yep. Ariel is absolutely striking today. We have bang, 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 and they are all done in squared and in squared. They are done, by the way, for different reasons. This one has no constant on the in squared, but it, what it does have is these trailing terms, which are just kind of useless. Like, no one needs them. Goodbye. They're just weak compared to the n squared. And this one has a constant, but three n squared is just the same as n squared anyway. And so that dies off too. And so finally, we have five n plus three n cubed and this massive monstrosity here. And who can classify both of those? Ariel, hold off because you're too good at this and you obviously understand what we're getting at. Uh, let's leave it for someone else. And by the way, if you are among the people who have not really talked so far, this is your shot. How would these be classified with big O notation? Sophie, absolutely correct. The five N dies because it's weaker than the N cubed. Even though the five is bigger than the three, the N is just weaker than the N cubed. And it's the end that we really care about. Like I said before, constants don't matter. And then the three, as before, just dies off and we're left with Owen cubed. And Owen factorial. Sophie takes the gold again, and we have this dies, this dies, this dies, this login certainly dies. And we have this occurring because in this hierarchy that we wrote out, in factorial beats everything else. It just it just does. It's just stronger, and even in the graph from before, n factorial grew faster than everything else. So yeah, exercise completely over. And finally, who can take guesses at the classification of binary and bubble sort? Linear search, we already know it's ON because we found that it was n over two operations, and ON of the two is just the same as ON. Constant, n over two is the same as n times a half, and a half just doesn't matter, it dies. Dies, O n equals O n. 
the binary search and bubble sort. Who has an idea for these? Wait, so does O just mean the average number that it's gonna be? Absolutely. I'm not oh, sure who okay. said that, but yes, absolutely. O is basically just, it makes all of the algorithms equal in its eyes and some of them not equal in its eyes. What it means is O of uh, F of N, where F is something, is the same as saying, I'm just going to post this in the chat because it's reasonably important to understand, but the same as saying that the, uh, that the algorithm uses approximately f of n, where f is some function like factorial cube, we used a lot of them today, it uses approximately f of n uh, operations in its running on a data set of size n. So if you had, for example, n students in your class, that would be a data set of size n, and that with linear search, we know is in over two operations on average. Got to add on average. On average, because sometimes, like almost all algorithms will have a, a best case where they just win on the spot. Almost all algorithms will do that. But some of them don't do that. And uh, yeah, some of them, oh, and there will also be a worst case, by the way. Worst case where the algorithm tries and tries and tries, but the configuration of all the data is just such that it takes ages to find. For example, if in linear search, the kid you're looking for is at the very back of the line. You run through everyone else before him. That's the worst case. And there are symbols for those like big O, but I won't go into them. Who can guess the binary search? Owen squared. Owen squared is a good guess, but I will give you a hint. Uh, binary search, uh, linear search is Owen, and we know that binary search is better than Owen. So binary search cannot be n squared because n squared is worse than Owen. It takes more time. Uh, o log n is correct, and the reason why is because of these powers of two involved in the binary splitting down. For those who remember from my poorly done MS Paint presentation, uh, we, we divided in half several times until all that we've got left is one element. Uh, and that is log n. For those of you who are like uh, year six, seven, eight and haven't heard of logs before, basically a log is an exponential thing. Uh, when you raise a number, say two to the power of another number, say three, that's equal to eight. And you could rewrite this as saying that the log eight is three. There are different bases for logs, but in uh, for those who are more advanced in computer science, we just use log base two. And for those who are really advanced, uh, the reason there's not a ternary search or a quaternary search or something like that, the reason we only use binary isn't because computers are naturally fitted with binary, but because in some sense, uh, log base three, uh, a ternary search would be log base three of n, and a binary search would be log base two of n, a quaternary search would be log base four. But in some sense, all of these are equal in the sense that uh, if you use log properties, you will find that the conversion between them is just a constant and constants don't matter. So that's for the advanced people out there. Uh, so yeah, it is log in. And how about bubble sort? Who can guess bubble sort? I thought that um, the log was like worse than um, n, like log n was worse than just n. Precisely, log n is worse. And for our purposes, that makes it better. Let me explain, so uh, <laughs> log n, and for our purposes, that makes it better because, so as we can see, uh, the n squared, y equals n squared thing, and the y equals n, both uh, kind of dominate this, that's the official term, they dominate this log n term here. Login term is small and weak, and these ones run off to infinity laughing. But the problem with that is that we don't actually want them to run off to infinity laughing. Imagine if you made a computer do infinity operations. It would take forever, literally. We want, we want login. What's, uh, when I said that they were better, what I meant by that was like they beat the other ones. They were stronger in this epic contest of which one prevails in the big O and which one is deleted. But for our purposes, we actually like it when 
the uh, functions are weak because what that means is that they're taking less time. They're taking less operations per, uh, if we remember back, I said the x-axis was the number, uh, the size of the input and the y-axis was the number of operations. So they're taking less operations as the input grows, whereas this one is racing off. And this one is racing off even faster. So it, it's good for us when they're weak. In general, uh, the hierarchy of which one beats, uh, which one in the evaluation of big O is the exact opposite of the hierarchy of which one we actually like the best. A constant time algorithm for like sorting or something would be the holy Jesus of all algorithms. It would be inc incredible if someone could make one of those. I don't think it's mathematically possible to do that, but uh, if you could make one of those, that would be incredible. Like something that uses, like an algorithm that always uses 14 operations to sort whatever data set you give it, that would be mind-bendingly cool. You only need 14 operations on a computer and you've got a data set all sorted. And even an O-N uh, algorithm would still be good. And to say nothing of an o log n algorithm, that would be amazing. But the best you can do is actually n log n. The bubble sort isn't n log n. It's worse than n log n. Worse for our purposes, better in the case of the big O. Log constant? I mean, O constant? Oh yeah, by the way, I forgot to mention that it is now way past the due date, just like I said it wasn't going to be. And yeah, if you want to leave right now, absolutely leave right now. Cheers. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, o constant is not quite correct. It is worse for our purposes. So that means that it is bigger. Uh, so. For example, it could be like O n cubed. It is not O n cubed or O n factorial or something like that. Bubble sort is in general worse than the best algorithms, which is why it's not used so often. Yeah, it's already eight minutes in. I don't want to keep you too long, so I will just tell you. The answer is that it's O n squared. And there's a couple ways to figure this out. First way is to go, get this off my screen. First way is to go through a bubble sort and just do it yourself and check how many operations you're doing. You'll find if you have an input of size n, you do, say if you have an input of size five, you'll do roughly 25 operations and so forth. Uh, actually, that's not quite right. In actuality, bubble sort is big O of n times n plus one divided by two. But when you expand that out, that's equal to O of n squared plus n, uh, O of half n squared plus half n, and that itself is equal to O of half n squared because the half n dies and that itself is equal to because constants don't matter O n squared. I'm just kind of writing this in the speaker notes but uh yeah that's the central idea it is an O n squared algorithm and the reason why you can do that you can also mathematically prove that so if we look back at the definition of bubble sort uh you can think about like how many times we're going to have to run through the list on average uh for example, uh, you might have noticed that the one took a while to migrate to the back of the list uh, to where it ought to belong. And in a random shuffle, the one is on average going to be in the middle of the list. That's O in for the one to get to where it's going. And then uh, there's in elements. So it's going to take roughly O in for each one of them to get to where it's going. It's a, and in O in times O in is going to be O in squared, which is a little bit of a shaky explanation, but essentially the idea is I couldn't really explain it without actually coding this up. And coding it up would take like a little while longer than I'm willing to go over time. So suffice it to say that it is O n squared. If you actually code it up, you'll find that what it's got is it's got a loop inside of a loop. And a loop is like O n because it runs through each of n elements once. So it's O n operations. And then a loop inside of a loop is going to be uh, n times an in times loop. Yeah, it's a bit distracting, a bit confusing, but that's the central idea. It's going to be, you're going to be doing in operations and you're going to be doing all that in times over. If you code this, uh, this text up into actual code, that is what you will find. We're way over time, honestly. Uh, I'm going to have to like cut this down to a lot shorter for next session. I think three algorithms might be a bit too much. Two algorithms will probably do it which still gives me time to include all the algorithms I'm planning to do. So I think we'll cut it off here, if that's okay with everyone. Have a nice day. 
Thank you.